Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes and welcome to drum roll please um, make your own drum roll make your own fanfare because I um, am way too uh, incapable of putting one in myself uh, as of last week which was my uh, cat who lived high video I have now posted 52 videos and as you know there are 52 well slightly more than 52 weeks in a year but I'm gonna call it my one-year anniversary anyways because I'm too lazy to mark time properly so how am I marking this I'm going to start a new series of videos which as you can tell by the title are books my dad who has a PhD in English literature thinks I should read because reading them improves my understanding of good literature or B-M-D-W-H-A-P-I-E-L-T-I-S-R-B-R-T-I-M-U-O-G-L. Uh, also known as Gwen Aimlessly Chatters About Real Literature. Um, at some point after this, I'll think of a nifty thing to uh, attach to this. Anyway, so Gwen Aimlessly Chatters About Real Literature. What am I chatting about this week? Um... Well, I figured that even though my father's list includes some books nobody's heard of, some books some people might go, eh, we're calling this literature, and uh, some books that people would say, well, yes, but if you're going for great literature, shouldn't you go for something a little bit more than that? I figured I'd start with a book that makes a lot of people's lists, and an author who makes most people's lists, Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice. Now, I need you to all understand that this is a, uh, that, uh, first of all, yes, this is advertising by ViewScan now, and that's because, uh, the scanner program was, there were things in scanner program issues and stuff. Anyways, um, so, uh, before I, I leave us on this, I'm going to just go forward for a moment because the picture on the cover of Pride and Prejudice is a detail from this particular painting, which is a portrait of Lady Colville by Henry Rayburn, um, who I will leave a uh, link to where you can see this picture at. Uh, and this is basically just a detail. This isn't Jane Austen or anything like that. This is just somebody. So here's the book, scan of the uh, cover of the particular edition that I've got. The particular edition that I have has a foreword by Tony Tanner, who has edited Mansfield Park and Sense and Sensibility, Villette by Charlotte Bronte, The Europeans by Henry James. And uh, he has a lengthy introduction. And by lengthy introduction, I mean that introduction is literally about 40 pages long. Um, and in it, he talks a lot about, <clears throat> about word usage in this. He talks about a comparison that he makes between King Lear, of all things, and uh, Pride and Prejudice, and a whole bunch of stuff about how this book is very much about um, about how much of this book is about the concept of appearance versus the internal and uh, and a great many things that uh, upon consulting with my father who as I said has a PhD in English literature my father felt that that was all bull and that I should ignore it. Unfortunately, it was too late and I had read the entire introduction. I had also, uh, my father, who is a great lover of Jane Austen, had spoken much of Pride and Prejudice. Um, so I went into this book with not merely the fact that I don't generally like romances unless something else is happening. Um... And this is not a book that's much about something else is happening. This is... The thing about Jane Austen is that Jane Austen is very much about small things. She is, in some ways, uh, comparable. And I'm not, make, I'm not drawing a direct comparison in terms of style or subject matter, per se, to Lucy Montgomery. But 
if you think about Anne of Green Gables, to pick one of the books that quote-unquote everybody has read, that's another book in which nothing happens. You know, the world doesn't change. Uh, we don't go on grand adventures. We don't see the deaths of hundreds. We don't save the world. We don't solve a murder mystery. This is just a book about life as it happens. And it's a small set of lives. It's a small set of people in a small place. And many of them are to uh, carry on with this particular uh to carry on with his particular linguistic usage. Many of them are small people. Um, and books like that require very, very careful handling, or else they become a book about absolutely nothing. And what I found about Jane Austen was that I may have to read this a second time, not so much because I enjoyed the hell out of it, because... It was okay. It was readable enough. The problem was that I found it picking up in the end, and I'm not entirely certain how much of that was my... that I was not taking things as seriously as I was at the start of the book. Part of the problem was that I went into this book well aware of a couple of important facts. One of those facts is that I started out this book um, with my father having spoken rather disparagingly of the negative description that Jane Austen gives to uh, <clears throat> that Jane Austen gives to Elizabeth and Jane and the rest of their mothers that that uh, Mrs. Bennet is described as flighty and foolish right from the start. But the problem is that while it doesn't come up until several chapters in that uh, the estate is entailed, and by entailment that means that the estate is bound in particular ways to the family and cannot be disposed of however it is that the current owner wishes to have it disposed of upon his death. That's why the estate would be going to Mr. Collins when Mr. Bennett dies. It's because that's, that's what entailment means. Now, we don't find this out until several chapters in, but I have to tell you, when you're talking about that time period, when you're talking about the 1700s, the 1800s, you're dealing with a time period where among the wealthy, a young woman who was a still unmarried when she got started getting into her mid-twenties. A young woman who was 23, 24, that was a young woman well on her way to becoming a spinster. She was well on her way to becoming a endless financial drag who would potentially never be married because much older than that and nobody would have her. And Mrs. Bennett's obsession with getting her daughters married does not, in fact, speak ill of her. It speaks, in fact, very well of her because this is a woman who was well aware that upon her husband's death, her daughters could potentially be cut loose. And as long as she and her husband have no sons, which probably they never will, there's no brother to support his sisters. There's nowhere for these girls, to, for these young women to go. And so her anxiety... As foolish as it sounds to us in the late 20th, early 21st century, as ridiculous as it seems to Elizabeth, is actually one of the rational things from her mother. Her mother's constant worry about this is actually completely rational. And when you place it into that social context, it made it very, very hard for me to be unsympathetic to the mother because whenever the mother was talking about that, I felt every bit of sympathy. Because no matter how ridiculous her father, the uh, Mr. Bennett thought this situation, no matter how silly the girls thought her, that one thing was entirely, entirely rational. Now, eventually... 
her behavior, her inability to realize that she's talking loudly enough to be overheard, all of those things, eventually those start to kick in and you start to see how she can be silly. But for me, it almost reads a little bit like we're discovering, for me, it was like discovering why Elizabeth ignores everything her mother says and we only discover this by having longer experience of her. And to me, it winds up being about a woman, or at least that particular aspect of the book, is about a woman who is ignored sort of in a boy who cried wolf way. That she's so foolish so much of the time that when she says something sensible, nobody's willing to listen to her. Now, that's not what the bulk of this book is about. The bulk of this book is about what I would call perfectly rational misunderstandings between people who both acted poorly. Um, because that's what this book is. Yes, you could say that Darcy is prideful, but it's, uh, it's not so, you know, he, he at the end of the book, gives us this grand denouement about how, you know, he had been raised in such a way that he always felt he was better than other people. But that's not really made explicit until the last four chapters of the book. And throughout the bulk of the book, Elizabeth's dislike of him is completely rational. From the way that he poo-pooed all of the society in the country with them, to everything that she heard from him, from other people, because, you know, a man like Bingley, who is so easily led, could very easily be duped by somebody who's a complete jerk into thinking that that complete jerk is his friend. And so, it isn't until the end of the book that I really felt like it started picking up, because that's when, and that's where really the uh, second read may, might need to come in for me, assuming I ever get around to it. And that is that at the end of the book is when I start really catching Mr. Bennett and really start catching on to him making snide comments about how Wickham is his favorite, uh, is, is the favorite of his uh, sons-in-law, mainly at one suspects because he very much enjoys making fun of him. And that it isn't until the end of the book that I really start picking up on how acerbic he is. Um, and I suspect that that was partly because I, I took too much of it too seriously. People talk about how this book is sparkling and it's funny and it's delicious social comedy, and the problem is that I take these things too seriously at times, and and it means that I find the book a sincerely humorless experience because I'm taking it too seriously, because I'm too much in sympathy with certain characters who are supposed to be figures of fun, because I see Lady Catherine's point to Lady Catherine's points too well, that I am far too aware of turns of phrase like what has love to do with marriage. And so I read this book and I don't see what others see in it until I started hitting the end, as I said. And so perhaps at some point I will skip reading the incredibly door introduction which compared this to uh, King Lear. And I will try, perhaps at some point, if I have the free time to do it and the inclination, to read it again and maybe even come back to it at that point. So this, uh, this ends my first installment of Gwen Reed's actual literature. And... Uh, I plan to every four or five books or so to uh, do another book on the list. So uh, back to our regularly scheduled doldrums next week.